All right, today we're going to, I'm, I'm going to, you'll see me looking at my notes a lot. This is a little bit of a complicated subject, and I just want to do it justice, but we're going to talk about autonomy today. Say autonomy. Say autonomy. There you go. <laughs> now, what is autonomy? It basically is self-governing, self-ruling, the liberty to make choices, to choose what you think is right and wrong in your life. You have that right as a human being to choose what you're going to do, to choose your life. To, you know, say this, I am, say this, I am the captain of my own ship. You know, a lot of times we want to blame God for everything. You know, God, you did this to me, or God, you did that. But we just sang a song, I Surrender. If, if God is in complete control of my life, what do I need to surrender for? He's the one pulling the strings, right? No, of course not. God has given you the ability to choose in your life what you're going to do, what you think is good, what you think is bad. He's given you that right to do that. And, and you and I have choices in life. And, you know, a lot of times, especially when you hear a message like this, then the responsibility really falls on you. Like, hey, I'm in charge. I'm in charge of what I think. I'm in charge of what I allow. I'm in charge of what I do. We're in charge of our own world, whether we think it or not. And I want to show you here, I want to talk to you for a minute about Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve in the garden is a perfect example of them making the choice. You know, a lot of people really struggle with God putting a, the tree of the knowledge of good and bad in the garden in the first place. Like, why would he even put that there? That's not fair. But what we need to realize is, and how many of y'all have ever been in a garden? Anybody ever had a garden? A garden, you work. You know, we, don't, we have this image of the Garden of Eden. They were sitting around in hammocks all day. And there, there was angels, you know, with big grape leaves. And they were feeding them cheese and nuts. No, no, it was a garden. And they worked the garden. They were in charge. God gave them dominion and authority over that garden. Now, it, there was no sin in the world, thank God at the time, but they were in authority in that garden. And God gave them the right to make choices even then. But that tree was there and they had this option. They could either allow God to teach them what was good and bad, or they could take it on themselves and eat of that tree and make the choice for themselves. So they could either let God help them judge what was good and bad, or they could judge it for themselves. And how many of y'all know when we start judging what's right and wrong, trouble comes real fast. When we begin to take it on ourselves. And unfortunately, that freedom to choose also gives opportunity for, for struggle, for trouble. You know, if everybody in this world was good... It'd be a lot easier to make decisions, but when there's a liar around trying to convince you to do things his way, that would be Satan, when he can convince you to do things his way, now we've got trouble coming. You have the right to choose what is good and bad. And if we do it apart from God, chaos is ensued. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened to Adam and Eve. Find Romans 5. You have the right to self-govern. But when the enemy sneaks in and he continues to skew our mind to get us confused. I mean, think, think about how complex the world is today. There is no right or wrong anymore. It's situational. It's if I think it's okay, it's okay. Well, that, that's a problem because if I think something's okay and you think something else is okay, now we're going to conflict. See, we have to have truth. We have to have absolutes. If not... We're going to have chaos. Romans 5 begins to talk about where this all originated from. You know, if you think about this for a minute, there are things on my streaming service. How many of y'all stream your television now? Anybody on here stream? There are things on my streaming service today that I can go in and hit play that when I was 12 years old would have been a rated X. You know, I, I heard a preacher in the 90s say this. There are things that happen today in a Christian's home that would not have happened in a heathen's home 50 years ago. Now, is, this is 30, almost 30 years later. How much more ha have we as a society fallen away from God to where a Christian doesn't even look like a Christian anymore? 
And, 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 and whether we want to admit it or not, we have the right to choose those things. We can choose to say, well, I know God's word says you're not supposed to do this, this, and this, but I'm going to make it okay in my life. And, and guys, chaos is coming. Chaos is coming. Here we're going to find out where this came from in Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all have sinned. Now skip down to verse 17. For if by the transgression of the one death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So then as though one transgression there were resulted condemnation to all men, even so through the act of one of righteousness there resulted justification to all men. So through one sin, transgression, condemnation, sin came in. But through Jesus Christ, righteousness came in. So now we basically have two sides and, and people struggle with this. People struggle with there just being a right and a wrong, don't they? We, we, we like to have a lot of gray in there. Well, I know this is what God says, and this is what the world says. I'm going to see how much gray I can stay in but still ca- stay connected to God. And unfortunately, when we do that, chaos is coming. Through one man, verse 19, through one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So we see where this underlying thing came from. Through Adam's, uh, Adam's decision... To call things good and bad. Adam's decision to take that onto himself brought sin into all the world. Death apart from Christ, apart from Jesus Christ, death will seep into every possible place it can. It's crept in our ability to make decisions. And as time has gone by, sin and death have continued to grow in the thinking of the world and the way the world works today. It's like a vine. How many of y'all have ever had crabgrass in your yard? Anybody ever had crabgrass? Y'all know what crabgrass is? I remember they used to have a little tiny piece of crabgrass. And then the next year, it got about this big. And then the next year, it got about this big. And then the next thing you know, I had what you call a crabgrass yard. And if you know, if you've ever fought that stuff, you know, you go to pull it and it's over there. It's like, what devil created this stuff? I want everybody to know that that is exactly what sin has done. Sin started out small, but it has eventually crept into our homes, into our thinking, into the way we view society, into the, what we call right and wrong. It's continued to creep. And the only way to get rid of crabgrass is you've got to tear every single bit of it out of your yard. You, you can't just spray it. Trust me. I mean, and, and, and man, it would grow under concrete. I mean, it just goes everywhere. Well, that's what sin does. That's what death does. That's what, when we choose to make our own decisions about what's right or wrong, that death and sin will sneak in there and influence the way you think. And then when it does, chaos is coming. Without Christ, we are bound to make decisions that lead to trouble. Remember the proverb. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end leads to what? To death. It seems like it's the right thing. We need God, and we need him more than ever before. You ever talk to somebody that considers themselves, you know, a free thinker, and they say, man, that Christianity is closed-minded. You Christians are closed-minded. You know, you need to think for yourself. Don't, you know, I remember one guy said to me one time, he said, that proverb says, don't lean to your own understanding. That's silly, man. You need to think for yourself. But how many of you know free thinkers don't move to an island with a notebook and start thinking for themselves? They read things. They bring things in. They watch things. They study things. And then all the free thinkers think alike. You see, we're all influenced by something. And I want to tell everybody in this room, if left unchecked, sin will work its way into every decision, everything you think. And you, in your autonomy, will make choices about what is good and bad, not based upon God Almighty, but based on that sin that has crept into our lives. And then we're stuck with chaos. Solomon said this, that there's nothing new under the sun. Guys, it's been this way since Adam and Eve in the garden. When we choose to do things on our own, when we choose to define right and wrong on our own, when we choose sin, 
will sneak in there and corrupt us. Unfortunately, not everyone is good. Isn't that sad? Not everyone is good. If everybody is good, life would be all right. But the devil isn't going to let everybody just be good. He's going to do everything he can to tear us down. Find Psalm 81. While you're doing that, I, I want to... Andrew, will you come on up here? I need a volunteer. Come on, son. Come on. I'm going to show you kind of a, a, the fallacy of, of when we choose what's right and wrong, how it, why it doesn't work. Come on up here, son. This is my son, Andrew. Just face them. Just, just stand still. Stand still. We checked his DNA. He's made a ham, I think. No, just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But see, you always want to control the microphone. You always want to control the no. So let's say I have my decisions about what's right and wrong. And he has his decisions about what's right and wrong. And he has a certain set of morals and I have a certain set of morals. And then one day, I want his wallet. Don't pull it out. No, you keep it. And, and, and let, uh, this happened in the first service. His wallet has $10 million in it. I want your wallet. You're going to give it to him? I said the first service, we're going to find out if carry, Andrew carries a weapon right now. <laughs> He's not going to just hand me that. So what's going to happen is the person with the most strength or the most power is going to determine what's right. It's not based upon morals. It's not based upon God's word. It's not based upon what's right and wrong. It's based upon who's strongest or who has the most authority. So I want what's his, and now I'm going to take it by force, or he's going to stop me by force. So it's whoever is the most powerful is the one that controls what's right or wrong. And it might not be with a weapon, it might be with a law in a capital building that controls what's right and wrong. It doesn't, it's not based upon what is actually right or wrong, it's based on what the most powerful person thinks is right or wrong. Do you understand that? So unfortunately, you know, we can pretend all we want, but whoever is most powerful is going to win if I get his wallet or not. Now, morally, is it wrong? Of course stealing is wrong. But if I want it to be right, I'll take it from him. And therefore, it doesn't work. Because all you need is one corrupt person to destroy it. And how many of you know there's a lot of corrupt people in the world today? Y'all give Andrew a big hand. Thanks for the $10 million, son. We need God. And we need him bad. Because what's happening is people are making decisions that change our lives, that affect our lives. And they're not doing it based upon God's word. They're doing it on who has the most power. And if corrupt people make decisions, then corruption comes. You understand that? So we as a people must realize this and take a stand as men and women of God of what is actually good and bad. It's not what is popular opinion. Sometimes following God is extremely unpopular. But I'd rather stand before him one day and say, him say, I'm proud of you, than stand before him and say, man, you just look just like the world your whole life. Psalm 81 says this, Hear, O my people, I think it's verse 8, Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you, O Israel, if you would listen to me. Let there be no strange God among you, nor shall you worship any foreign God. I, the Lord, am your God who brought you from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. And here we are. But my people did not listen to my voice. And Israel did not obey me. That's the pause button there. It's not just about hearing, it's about doing. It's not just about hearing what he says, it's doing what he says. Verse 12, so I gave them over to the stubbornness of their heart to walk in their own devices. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would quickly subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their adversaries. Oh, that people would listen to God. And this is the most important thing that I think everybody needs to see. You're here today for a reason. You're here because you're wanting to follow God. You're here because you're wanting to be more like Christ. You're here for that. So that's a very important step. But we need to understand that that isn't the only step. It's not just about coming to church. It's about hearing and being obedient and allowing God to be the major force in our life in the way we see things. Not just coming to church. You know, back there it talks about don't go after strange gods. And they would build these shrines and these temples and they'd put up these poles and they had all these things that they did. Now today our gods are 
and most of our laps are in our pockets right now. It's the thing that encourages us. It's the thing that influences us. It's the thing that we spend hours and hours and hours staring at. I want you to think about something. If you know the average time of your phone, how much time you spend in a day on your phone. Let's say, and I'm going to throw this out there. This is high, but there are a lot of people that do it. If you spend five hours a day on your phone, say, well, Josh, I use it for business. Yep, okay. If you spend five hours a day on your phone, in 24 years, you'll have spent, this is simple math, you'll have spent five years of your life staring at the phone. That's crazy. That's crazy. But that thing influences us so much. It really does. You know, the Message Bible says this in that one scripture. It says, but my people didn't listen. Israel paid no attention. So I let go of the reins and told them, run and do it your own way. See, we need to realize something, that God is not a puppet master. He's not going to force you. He's not going to force you to do anything. If you want to do it your own way, if we're stubborn, if we're stubborn with God, he's going to let go of his part and say, have at it. Have at it. You can do whatever you want to do. And unfortunately, then we need to realize what's coming our way. Choose today, it says, who you will serve. Choose what you're going to do. And we need to realize that sin has a progression. Sin is not just a one-time thing, but it is not content on just sitting there. It wants to consume us. It wants to devour us. God told Cain this. He said, look, sin is waiting for you, and its desire is for you. Sin doesn't, isn't just satisfied with you doing something. Sin is only satisfied when it brings death to all of us. It wants to devour our life. Jesus said it like this, the gate to destruction is wide. And the road that leads there is easy to follow. And a lot of people like to go through that gate. Find John 8 with me. I want to challenge everybody in this room today. What is influencing your decision to make what's right and wrong? What is influencing you on what you call good and what you call bad? If it's not God, I hate to tell you this, it's trouble. If God is not the major influence in what your morals are and what you think is good and bad, if God is not the major influence, your life and my life, if he is not the major influence, we'll go straight down the toilet. And then, as we're going down the toilet, we shake our fist at God and say, why did you do this to me? And God said, I told you, I'll let you go for the stubbornness of your heart. Do it. You wanted this, didn't you? Well, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I didn't, I didn't. Why didn't you tell me? I told you, I warned you. I had that preacher stand up in that church service and talk to you about it. But you did it anyway. That's the challenge for us all today. What is influencing the way we think is right and wrong? And I'm going to tell everybody in this room, if it's the world, trouble's coming. John 8 verse 31 says, So Jesus was saying to those Jews who believed him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered and said, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it you say you will become free? And Jesus answered them and said, truly, truly, I say, whoever commits sin is the slave to sin. See, sin, there it is. Sin wants to enslave you. Sin wants to hold you. Sin wants to captive, ca make you captive. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you are freed indeed. There is a freedom that only comes through Jesus Christ. There's a freedom that you can only found, find in Jesus Christ. And if not, sin is there by default waiting to enslave you. We need to realize this. If you choose not to decide, your choice is made for you. If you choose to be apathetic and just say, que sera, sera, your choice will get made for you. And sin waits to enslave you. But there is great freedom in Christ. And you say, well, Josh, you know, 
Christianity is, is old, it's out of date, it's archaic, it doesn't even, it's not even relevant anymore. That's an old, that's a 2,000 year old book. Why are y'all living by that? I don't know about you, but I think being a light in the world, I think helping people out, I think loving God and loving my neighbor as myself, I think that's timeless. In fact, I think if a lot more people were like that today, there'd be a lot less junk that happens in our world. So I'm not saying it passed away, but I want you to think about this. There is great freedom in him and in his word. Now, everybody here got to church on a road. You either drove or you rode with somebody. Now, imagine if when you got on the road this morning, you said, Today, I will decide what is right and wrong on this road. And you decide that you're going to drive in the lane of oncoming traffic because that's what you want to do today. It's your choice. You choose what's right and wrong on the road. Or let's say, you know what? I'm going to choose to drive 100 miles an hour. I'm going to go as fast as I can down this road. Or let's say you just said, I think the road was meant to be walked on. And you're going to walk right down the middle of that road on the yellow lines. Because it's your choice to decide what's right and wrong on the road, right? Well, of course that's silly. And if that did happen, we'd have pain, we'd have destruction, we'd have all kinds of things happen. But... If we follow the rules on the road, there is great freedom to do whatever you want. You can drive to California today if you follow the rules on the road. See, in Jesus Christ, when we follow his way of life, when we live the way he asks us to live, there is great freedom in that. But if we decide to make up the rules of our own and say, I think this is right, and I think this is right, and I'm going to do this, pain, destruction, and consequences come. There are some of you out there today, you just make up the rules when you're driving to Roanoke. You say, I'm going to stay in the passing lane and do 50. And I just want you to know, if you have a faith fellowship sticker, take it off your car. <laughs> no, I always have to make a plug about the left lane drivers. God help you. That's not right. And, 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 and there, are, there are police in here that will tell you, and you can find them. If you're in that lane, you're either passing. What's that thing about... Get off the pot. How do you say that? I can't remember. <laughs> you either get in that lane and go, or you get back in the right lane. See, you're, 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 putting, you're making the law on your own. You're, you're, no, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. But seriously? I want to read to you this scripture. It's in Galatians 5. I'm going to read it out of the Message Bible. It is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Again, within the constraint of God's word and God's commandments, he's called us to live free in that. Just make sure you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want. And, and look at this, and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in this single sentence, love others as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. If you bite and ravage each other, watch out. In no time at all, you will be annihilating each other. And there, and where will your precious freedom be then? You see, our freedom isn't there for us to do whatever we want. Our freedom is there to serve, to love, to help, to be a light. But if we choose to define what is right and wrong, if we choose to define what is good and bad, if we choose that thing on our own... We'll end up ravaging each other. We'll end up annihilating each other. We'll use our freedom to do whatever we want, and then trouble comes. Guys, I, I, I need us, we all need to recognize this, that truth is truth. It is absolute. It's absolute. But if we know that truth, we'll get set free. And there is a freedom that only comes in Christ Jesus. Find James 1 with me. We were meant to choose that one command, love one another as you love yourself. And, it's, and, and, and here's, the, here's the thing, it's God's definition of love. You know, it's all about love. Who's, whose definition of love? Now here we are, we're right back to that same question. Who gets to define what this love is? Do I get to define it or do you get to define it? Or should we let God define it? Love that's selfless, sacrificial. Love that doesn't get angry. Love that doesn't boast. You know, we have the, the simple definition. 
But unfortunately, the Bible says all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Without God's word, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life will be how you set your rules for your world. That love that consumes, devours, wants, but never gives. See, we got to let God define God's word for love. Not let the world define God's word for love. Here in James, we're going to look at this and then we'll close. James 1.22. This is, this is for us. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourself. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, and then you forget what you look like. But if you carefully look into the perfect law that sets you free. Sets you free. So many people want freedom, but they don't realize that the freedom is right there in that book. The word of God, the spirit of God, that's the freedom you're longing for. And if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Verse 26, if you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, Lord help us, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Verse 27, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for the orphans and the widows in their distress. And then look, and refusing to let the world corrupt you. And that's exactly what the world wants to do. It wants to corrupt us. It wants to get us off. It wants to change the way we think about things. What's natural, get, just get us so mixed up that chaos comes. That's all it wants. That's all the enemy wants is chaos. Jesus came to change us. Jesus came to reestablish what Adam lost. A right relationship with God. And what comes when we live with it. And it's your choice. It's my choice. And we have to do we have to realize that that choice belongs to us and no one else. If we let the world continue to warp us, if we let the world continue, if we let that crabgrass continue to sneak into our life, the only difference between us and the rest of the world is what we do on Sunday mornings. That's going to be the only difference. We're going to look like it, smell like it, think like it, act like it, be like it. If we continue to let it, or we can stand up for the word of God. We can stand up. And, and again, it's not going to be popular. And, and we need to realize that. It's not going to be popular. But it'll be worth it. It'll be worth it when we look him in the face. I want to challenge you. Stand strong. And, and you know, a lot of people, have you ever heard this? Ignorance is no excuse. Anybody ever heard that? Is anybody awake? Anybody ever heard that? Ignorance is no excuse. My, my, uh, my, uncle, my uncle and um, aunt, they, they like to play um, board games. And one of the things that they'll do is they go through the rules real well before they play so they know the rules. Guys, that Bible is the rules to live by. If we don't ever pick it up, we're going to lose the game. If we don't ever look at what it says, we're going to allow the world to influence the way we govern our life. If we don't ever pick up that book and read what it says, and ignorance is no excuse. You got the Bible. Some of you got seven Bibles. And then everybody's got one on their phone now. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, are we going to let ignorance be our excuse? Are we going to pick up the word and live by it? Are we going to allow that to be the thing that dictates what's good and bad in our lives? You know, all this stuff, and I just want to take it back around to this, all this stuff comes back to relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, what's great about this is when we make the decision to follow him, he gives us the grace to do it. So I want to offer Jesus Christ to you this morning. You say, Josh, that, I really don't, what does that have to do with this? It has to do with the beginning of a relationship with God. And that's where it all starts, a relationship with God. Without that relationship that comes through Jesus Christ, this, this message doesn't really make much sense. But once you begin that relationship with God, your whole world will change. And you're going to find the freedom that you have been looking for. 